welcome to another uh, edition of Reef Talk every Sunday. Uh, I'm Steve from Rotter Tube Reef, and then we have Scott from Mile High Reefers, and we have uh, Mike from um, 915 Mang on YouTube. Yeah, Mike, we finally got Mike. <clears throat> so Hi, Mike, Mike, Mike's uh, channel is one of my favorites. He does a really good job at his video productions and his narrations and everything like that. So check out his channel if you haven't already. Um, so Mike, uh, just kind of give us a little info on your channel, what your tank is, uh, like size-wise, and a li little info on you. Well, uh, my name is Mike. I go by 915 Mang, uh, 915 being the area code. Uh, Mang, all of you have seen uh, Scarface, you know, Tony Montana's all there, man. You know, that's how I got that. Uh, <laughs> that's great. Just, just a person from El Paso. Uh, in love with salt water um i've had this 120 this 120 is a, a custom built tank from a local reefer here and uh he actually has like a store he custom built my tank and um and i've had it for about three wow. years uh i just uh like everybody i got into it from uh salt freshwater and then from freshwater i jumped over to salt water and i didn't know what i was getting myself into um um, I used to keep a book of like how much I've spent, you know, sand, salt, pumps, done. Uh, I don't do that anymore because yeah. when I first started, yeah. that little book was uh, over probably $500 just starting off. So Yeah, it um, is expensive. Um, people say, oh, I would read before I started. Oh, it's expensive. And I thought, yeah, <clears throat> well, I've got... Um, I'm a photographer oh, and, a, yeah. and a guitar player, so I, my gear is really expensive. <laughs> it oh, yeah. really it's, is. But you know what? This saltwater hobby is really expensive. I mean, it's not as expensive as that other stuff, but, man, it's expensive. So I'm done. Yeah. I'm done buying stuff. That's what you said last time. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and then I just say get that new power <laughs> head. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, two of them. Yeah. But now I'm done. <laughs> For real this time. Wait, but a, a new protein skimmer showed up at the door yesterday, which is going to be a new... <laughs> and now I'm done. Now I'm totally done. All right. I'm, I'm done. Mike, so um, so you said a custom tank. That's awesome. I mean, was it... Why did you get a custom? And it's, to, to me, the word custom means like really expensive. Um, Actually, I was looking online and I wanted that Starfire. Because um, back in the day when I was watching YouTube... Um, there wasn't so many channels. There was like a, a Mr. Saltwater guy mm -hmm. around here. And uh, I just like the dimensions because with custom, I wanted something that would fit my kitchen. And I would still have enough room, you know, kind of built around the kitchen. Yeah. Now, if I could go back getting the house, I would build a fish room around the, you know, the tank mm. and stuff like that. That would be pretty sweet. Um, what are the dimensions of your tank? My tank is actually pretty tall. Um, it looks like nice, man. Oh, yeah. oh, that's oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, so the stand itself is like 20 something inches. And then uh, lengthwise, it's, you know, 60 inches, so five foot. And then depth, it's about 19 inches or so. That's really 19, nice. 19, 18 inches right around there. And then yeah, the I really sump, like the tall tank. Thank you. The sump is around. Uh, just like a 40 gallon gallon breeder, but that was also custom. Oh, nice. That's nice. So I think total I paid about $1,200 just for the tank stand. And then I ended up making my own stand because I wanted the stand taller. Mm -hmm. than really, for custom, that's not a bad price. Yeah. My um, off the shelf one was 1000 So yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. how, how long is your tank, Scott? I forgot. Six feet. Okay. Yeah. All right. Oh. And how, it, what is it? Was it a 210? Two, what is it? 210, yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> the tank looks awesome. What fish do you have in it now, currently? Well, um, that's the thing. I I have, because of, uh, you know, mistakes, I never quarantined at all. Mm -hmm. I would just throw my fish in there, uh, hope for the best. And uh, I did that, but I want to get a, a powder blue I want to get uh, maybe a purple tang for sure, yeah. a yellow tang. Yeah, and uh, be maybe careful about those two together. <laughs> mm -hmm. A yellow tang, 
purple. The yellow and the purple. Uh, I tried that, and now my yellow tank lives in the sump. <laughs> you got to put yeah. that guy back. <clears throat> I was thinking about that yesterday. I almost did it. But that's weird because you have a lot of uh, rock work and yeah. mine's pretty open. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah, it's just it's two zebra soma tanks together. They battle. I'm really thinking about getting like a sail fin or a scopus or maybe a couple more yellows and trying that route. But that's pretty risky too. Mm. So we're going to talk today, as the title says, uh, quarantining, right? Um, so we can each briefly talk about what we do, but I want to focus on, you know, what Mike does. Um, it's always great to have another point of view of how you do things. Um, so Scott, why don't you start out? What do you do as far as, you know, quarantining when you pick up a new fish? And uh, quarantining, for those of you who don't know, because we want to focus on <clears throat> new people to the saltwater aquarium trade, of course, um, quarantining is where um, you want to use, and I know you're going to not want to do this really, but it's a separate aquarium, a small one, doesn't have to be like what Mike has behind him, uh, but it's a hospital tank, and you're going to take your new bought fish, or actually anything you get from the um, LFS, a local fish store, reef store, whatever you want to call it, and you want to put them in the tank for about three weeks just to kind of monitor them, view them, make sure there's no weirdness going on, they're not acting all strange, because if they do have a parasite or any kind of disease, you don't want to put that in your main tank because all your fish can die. Um, so this is something I didn't do in the beginning, and a lot of people don't, and even advanced people don't, which is a mistake, um, because it'll bite you in the end. Um, just really quick, just to interject, I want to say that I finally finished my book, How to Kill Ick in a Saltwater Aquarium. It's available at my site, rotatube.com. It will also be on Amazon for Kindle. So check that out. It's inexpensive. It's like 33 pages. It gives you everything you'd want to want to learn about Ick and how to kill it. And it's a great reference guide for those of us who are already quarantining. I just want to throw that in there. So, Mike, when you... Um, I'm sorry, we said Scott. Sorry, everybody. Scott, go ahead. Quarantine. Okay. So I put out a video lately about wanting to change my quarantine setup, and I haven't fully figured out what I'm going to do, but I think what I'm going to end up doing is probably the sand bed. I'm still debating on whether I'm going to keep the sand bed, mm. a heater, and then I'm going to buy an aqua clear back filter. And if you're not familiar with those, it has the sponge in it with the um, kind of like ceramic filter media. And this will give me kind of biological filtration. Because the problem with the normal clear quarantine system that I find is when you just have glass in there and an air stone and a heater, that ammonia builds up and no ammonia is safe for your fish. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first time that fish goes to the bathroom, it's putting ammonia in your tank. And I don't like that. So I want that biological cycle to happen where we're converting um, the ammonia from ammonia to nitrite to nitrate. So that's what the sand bed was doing for me before. I'm debating on whether I want to keep that, but no matter what, I'm going to go ahead and get the aqua clear to kind of give me that biological filtration going on because I want to get that ammonia out of there as fast as possible. You can do that with big water changes, but I find that also stresses the fish. And one thing I haven't been doing was treating with copper immediately. My quarantine tank was much more just a tank where I could monitor the fish. I'm thinking from now on, I'm probably going to just go ahead and put copper in when I get a tang in a small dose. Just because every tang I've ever had ends up with egg. It just, it happens. So that's kind of where I'm at on quarantines right now. Really quick, you want to interject uh I lost a couple tangs when I was doing quarantining, and <clears throat> tangs are more sensitive to the copper. For that reason, you know, Scott and I have talked about this a lot. Um, I what I do is I dose the half half of the recommended dosage for cupramine copper by cecum, cecum, whatever you want to call it, um, because a full dose it could be a little. Yeah, I'm, I mean, it you're looking at with copper and fish, especially tangs. You're literally looking at a very fine line between life and death i mean one of the last right. tangs i had a while ago just doing great eating swimming everything was awesome dead the next morning and i think it was due to copper so ever since then a while ago um i i dose half the recommended and it'll still kill the parasites and it'll be a nice copper bath for the fish less lethal for them 
With the copper dosing, though, one thing I want to bring up is if you're going to dose copper, you should have a copper test kit on hand yeah, definitely. to test that copper because it's really easy to overdose that stuff. That's right. Uh, how large is your quarantine tank? I got a 29-gallon. Okay. So that's good. I mean, that's fine. You know, that's yeah. good enough. Um, the thing to keep in mind with a quarantine tank, too, is a 29-gallon is more than enough. But if something happens where a tank crashes, you need to get your fish out fast. Like, if you've got, like, a bunch of tangs like I do, um, and you, you cram them all into your tank like I do, you want to make sure that you've got a, a quarantine that'll fit them all comfortably, which I didn't until I started using my 75-gallon old aquarium for my quarantine. So I think that's a great point. And I think I'm going to do that once this Nassau gets out of the quarantine to put sand in the bottom. I think I'm going to buy just a bag, a, like a 20-pound amount of sand, and throw it in there, you know? Because I really like that idea. It's a great point about just all glass. There's no nitrous, nitrogen cycle going on, and you've really got to keep up on the water changes. You still will have to keep up on the water yep. changes, but with that sand, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that will help. A lot. It's also less stressful for the fish, especially if you're putting things like wrasses in there that bury themselves in the sand. Yeah, right. And then also for for you guys <clears throat> who are quarantining and just using all glass <clears throat> like we all pretty much are, um, if you have a wrasse or a sand sifter, and I said on a previous Reef Talk show what you can do, and I didn't do this, but I just thought of it, you can take like get a bowl and just fill it with sand and put the bowl in your aquarium. So your whole sand bed is not there, it's just glass but you've got a bowl for the guy to sift in there's a little tip um so <clears throat> was that it scott did you have more to add no that's about it okay those are great points um mike um what do you do for your quarantining currently what size tank do you use what's what's your process generally when you bring a fish home from uh the store well that's the problem prior to uh actually setting up a quarantine tank i would just get the fish i would look at them at the lfs um, I would try to see if they ate. Sometimes they would feed them, sometimes they wouldn't. Um, I would pay attention to the way they are breathing, if they were breathing shallow. Um, and that turned around and, you know, bit me in the butt. Um, I lost, I had got a great deal on some antheas. Uh, three or four, all of those guys died. And uh, my yellow tang died. Um, my blue hippo tang almost died. Mm. So from, from that point on, I was like, you know, I'm not going to take the chance anymore. And I bought a 10-gallon uh, little tank. And what I'm going to do is I'm kind of debating. I have my 10-gallon. I still have my 20-gallon outside. And my 20-gallon I was using as a frag tank. But I got the 10-gallon just because it's, you know, saves space and it's more convenient for me. So what I'm going to do, I got some uh, the sponge filter. I soaked it in the back of the my sump. Um, I got... I had some ceramic rings that came with my SCA tank. I ha I've had those in the sump. And I got the rings and the sponge sitting in a 10-gallon with the Fluva filter. And then with that, um, so that way I can kind of establish some biological filtration. I still want to buy some of that little Biospira. I had some uh, dry rock out in my house, and I threw that in my sump, and I'm going to throw that in my 10-gallon. Uh, so... Pretty much what I want to do is more natural. I kind of want to still turn my 10-gallon uh, quarantine tank into a frag tank because I'm testing out that, you know, Micmo LED. So that's what I'm doing. Uh, I like the idea of what you said about sand. I didn't think about that. Um, and I, I just, for, for me, I just want to kind of keep it as natural as possible. I, I don't think I'll put a protein skimmer on there and... Uh, throw some live rock and then see if the fish does okay, you know, because I want to get some more tangs. Uh, I want to get a, I really want to get a powder blue tang, a uh, purple tang if I can find them, if it's not too expensive, yellow tang. Um, I like the yellow eye cold tangs, but. Uh, <clears throat> Those guys are awesome. They're beautiful. I've got one. They're awesome. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, I I like what you're saying about the biological and stuff. That's um, pre-soaking everything in your main display and then putting it in there sounds like a really good idea. Yeah, that is a very good idea, and that's something you should do. Um, um, one because, thing. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, sir. Um, don't call me sir. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's my dad. 
and that means I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> Mike's a very cool, polite guy, but don't call me sir. Um, <laughs> um, you brought up a point where your ten gallon. Um, now I don't think you you said you used to use the ten gallon for quarantine or no? No, I I had just bought that. I'm kind of okay. on the fence of jumping from either the ten gallon. I like the ten gallon because it's convenient. It's not a doesn't take up a lot of room. Yeah, that's um, right. I like the twenty gallon because I the tanks would have. Plenty of room to swim in there by themselves. Right. Um, the only reason I bring that up is if you were using it as a quarantine like Scott and I were and you were dosing copper in it, um, and then you decide, you know what, <clears throat> I'm going to use the 20-gallon for the fish instead. Let me use this 10-gallon for the corals. If you put corals in there, they'll die um, because copper yeah. kills corals instantly. So you really, and I know you didn't do this. That's why I asked. I didn't think you were doing it. But if you guys are in that situation, you have to completely just disinfect that 10 gallon like just plain water take it outside with garden hose just nail it with white vinegar and just really make sure you wash it because that that uh, copper gets into the uh what is it silicone inside of the everyday wear yeah. everywhere um so i just wanted to throw that out there for those of you who are well, changing tanks into a frag tank i mean here's what i can't stress enough if you're going to be keeping a quarantine tank have that copper test kit. You're right. <clears throat> Just like the tank you're talking about, when you put it together, go ahead and test that water for copper. And if it shows up at all, don't put coral in it. I mean, that's just the most important thing you can do is have that copper test kit so you know how much copper you're dosing and when you're going to put something else in there, if there's any re residual stuff that's going to hurt your invertebrates. Right. So, uh, Mike, when, when you... When you do your so, have are you currently or in the beginning you said that you you made the mistake and you, you didn't do the quarantine. Are you doing the quarantine now or it's currently yeah. something that you're going to be moving on to or or have you been doing it? No, it it's been going about uh, two weeks now. Oh, okay. Uh, I I got some dry rock just recently. I want to throw some more biological in there, and then I'm supposed to take my wife out for lunch, and we're gonna swing by the LFS. And I want to pick up some live rock there. Mm. Uh, I was also kind of thinking, I don't know about what you guys think about the hypo salinity. Um, I don't know if it's all hype or, you know, I was kind of thinking about doing that as well. So, so my thoughts on the hypo salinity, I know <clears throat> I get reamed for not doing it by some people. My thoughts are um, you're going to get a tank or a fish from the reef store, ideally you're going to be able to put him in close to the salinity that you get him from, but odds are you don't know what that is. I like to use water directly from my display tank, mm -hmm. and that way I'm acclimating the fish to the display water so it's not a change, right? Because if you put him in hypo salinity, you're going to take him from whatever he's at at the reef store, probably somewhere between um, 1.20 and 1.026, right? And kind of that range. So you're going to stress the fish once going to hypo salinity, and then you're going to stress them out again when you start bringing them back up to the normal reef tank salinities. So it may be beneficial from like messing with ick a little bit, but when it comes to ick, copper is the way I want to deal with it. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, in the end, it's all what you guys want to do, it's all about experimentation. While keeping your fish healthy, I don't do the hypo salinity at all. I will do what Scott uh, just said, and <clears throat> I uh, no. If you're gonna do like the one point zero two zero, um, you want to bring up the salinity over a slow amount of time, maybe a, a couple weeks, to match the same as what your main tank is before you put him in. I would just use the tank water. Like here's an example today. I do a water change every weekend. I'm going to take 10 gallons out of my display tank. Instead yeah. of putting it down the drain, yeah. I'm going to take 10 gallons out of the quarantine tank with the Nassau tank. I'm going to put the 10 gallons from the display tank in there for that guy. It's not bad water because there's no ammonia in it, and it's the same salinity and everything as the display, so he'll be all right. Um, but here's one thing that I do is a step further. I made a video on this. As far as hyposalinity... I think you've really got to bring the salinity down pretty low, um, like really low. Like people have said, 1.009. Yeah. And yeah, it's even 008. Um, so I don't mess with that at all. That's just what I do. But what I do is 
um, I'll use no salt whatsoever just for my equipment. Like I'll have like a couple five gallon Home Depot buckets and I'll fill them with water from the hose and I'll let them sit in out there for a week outside and I'll throw my nets in there and I'll throw my pumps in there and I'll just let them sit in the, the water with no salt for a week. 24 hours is good enough. But if there's any, any ick or anything, I'll clean my gear like that once in a while. I'll just let it sit in water with no salt and that will cause those parasites to pop. So I don't use the hypo. I just use the... Uh, 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 half dose copper, and that's really and, it. And that's another interesting thing because I, you know, I I watch YouTube, and I'm also on the forums. Uh, I like to be, I like Reef Central and Reef to Reef, and you know, and I've seen them talk about like freshwater dips, and yeah, I don't, yeah. Know, I haven't never done that. I do that too, and it works fine. Um, like, sorry, I don't want to interrupt. I just want to interject because you brought up a great point there. Um, like with this Nassau came from the reef store. I filled my uh, five-gallon bucket with pure RODI water that was 78 degrees, and I put him in there gently with the net for about a minute and a half, and he was fine. He was chilling out. He was swimming around okay. Um, no more than two minutes. You don't want to do it more than two minutes. Some people do three minutes. They start to stress out around the three-minute mark. Two minutes, he was great, and that causes the parasites to to flesh out of his body if there's any in him then i put him in the quarantine so i believe that's a great step in prepping him for the quarantine so the parasites don't unleash if there are any on him in the qt you can let them all come out into the uh, pure water then throw them in qt and then also once after three weeks when he's out of qt i'll give him another fresh water bath for two minutes before i put him in the main tank and the main reason for that is to basically wash off any of the copper that might be on him so none gets in the display, you know. So a bath going in and a bath coming out, you know, whatever. So that's what I do. And, and it's okay. They're okay with that. Yeah, freshwater dip isn't something I've done before. But with the research I've done on it, I'm thinking Steve's right and that's what I should be doing. So whatever fish I buy next, he's definitely getting a freshwater dip before he goes in the QT. Yeah, it helps. Just, you know, a minute is even okay, you know, and just watch them. And if they start to freak out, and they really don't, they're okay. So, like, the next time, <coughs> make us a video on you guys doing the freshwater dip because I'm, I've never done it. I'm still too chicken to do that. Mm -hmm. And also with the RODI, I think the RODI water is, you probably could use regular water, you know, because... Supposedly, RODI has low oxygen. Yeah. In it, so. You could, and I have done it with tap water, too. My water is really good. I got a report from the village, very low metals. I mean, I'm lucky to have really good tap water, um, but tap water is still tap water. However, yeah. you're right. For the freshwater dips, I've done it. It's fine. I, I would only... just be afraid of the chlorine. It's kind of <clears throat> poisonous to the fish. I, I know that short period of time won't kill it. It's just kind of an extra stressor. I don't know if it needs yeah, I don't know about the level, how much of a stressor that would be, um, and I shouldn't have done it, but I did because I didn't have any RODI at the time. For this guy, I did, but if I didn't, I would have used tap water, you know. But yeah, that's a good point. I've done uh, tap water as well. With my followery, I use tap water for the fresh water in and out, and he's fine. He was fine. So my understanding behind the way the fresh water dip works is the... Fish goes in, and it's a larger organism, so it can stand being in fresh water much longer than smaller organisms like parasites, like parasitic worms, like flukes and stuff like that. And they'll actually fall off and die long before the fish is going to stress at all. Are, is this kind of how you're understanding that it works, Steve? Yeah, right. Yep, that's exactly right. Yep. The parasites will actually pop because <laughs> with no salinity in the water, they just kind of implode. I mean, literally, they just pop. They don't have a chance, which is why <clears throat> if you're going to use a quarantine tank, you never want to use the same equipment on that as your display. So, you know, just to make sure, like I said, you know, when I'm done with the quarantine, I'll let the equipment sit in uh, clean water for a week just to make sure. Because, you know, you can accidentally grab a net and use it on another tank. So, yeah. But yeah, that's right. They'll they don't stand a chance. And the also, I'm a fan of garlic. I know you guys don't like garlic, but well, like garlic. 
I I, I don't like, like garlic. I don't like garlic. <laughs> it's dude. It's awesome. As a meth- I don't like garlic as a method to kill. Oh, I thought we were talking about like <laughs> I, pasta. As something to eat. I love pasta. Oh, okay. I love Italian, but no, I don't like garlic as a method to kill ick. I think garlic is an excellent method to keep your fish eating. So if your fish has an yes, ick and it's right. and it's not eating, yeah. then the garlic can definitely help with yeah. the eating and stuff like that. Garlic doesn't kill ick. It just helps right. the fish eat and it maintains the fish's health from that direction. It'd be like if you were sick and you weren't eating, you're going to be less healthy that way. So garlic helps with that, but it doesn't help with the disease. Right. And it's also awesome in a quarantine tank because fish could be stressed. They might not want to eat using garlic. Yeah. And it entices them to eat. So, yeah, I, I use it. I, I love it. They love it. Um, yeah, for what Scott said. Right. 